So I, I, I'd like to begin with a very brief introduction to the shape optimization problem and then give you some examples of the applications of, of shape optimization and then talk about some interesting aspects of, uh, of this problem and it's sort of the inherent difficulties at a kind of a higher level. Uh, although at the end I'll try to get into some details. So as the name suggests, we're dealing with optimization problems in which the unknown is the shape, the shape or geometry of a physical system. And uh, by that I mean that the objective uh, function uh, not only depends on the shape explicitly, but also depends on the physical response of the system that has the given shape. And that's typically characterized by the solution to a boundary value problem that in turn depends on your shape, uh, in this case uh, shown little omega. So um, we've already seen actually a, a number of examples of optimization, PDE constraint optimization problems in the past two days. Uh, the keynote uh, uh, speaker today talked about inverse problems, very much similar in the same spirit of what you have here, or optimal control problems. In this case, the control is the shape, the shape based on which the PDE is defined. So uh, what I'll use as a model problem in the remainder of the talk uh, is a sort of a problem that's significant from a historical perspective in structural optimization. This is the problem of minimizing compliance. So the, the physical response to the system is its deformation. So you have some applied loads and support specified. And this om big omega is the, the, the extended domain in which you're trying to find the optimal shape. So the, the physical response is the deformation of the system. And in the case of compliance, you have, you're trying, you have two competing effects. You're trying to minimize the external work done by, by the applied tractions. And at the same time, you have a constraint on the volume of this shape. So these are competing effects. You're trying to maximize effectively stiffness while minimizing the amount of material that you're using. So it, here I'm showing the uh, boundary value problem in, uh, in a variational form for elasticity. What I would call your attention to is the fact that, so this is your shape. And the void regions, just to avoid sort of the degenerate regime, let's assume that instead of having air, you have some very weak or compliant material with stiffness C minus. Um, but what I would call your attention to is the dependence of your boundary value problem in this unknown shape omega, and that appears in, you know, through the characteristic in the stiffness term, through the characteristic function associated with your uh, uh, set omega. And characteristic function is a function that takes value of one over your set and zero off your set. So essentially, we're dealing with a problem that has a binary nature. So keep that in mind. We will uh, return to that issue. So some applications, as you would expect, you have applications in sort of structural engineering, mechanical engineering design. This is a work that was recently done in collaboration with a uh, structural engineering firm in Chicago, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. They're responsible for design of high-rise buildings that are well known, like the Sears Tower in Burj Dubai. This was, work, this was an actual competition, work done to uh, find the optimal shape for the lateral bracing system of a tall building. Now, the range of applications are quite diverse, though. So here's an exa another example for a work that was done in our group uh, in the medical field. This was done in collaboration with surgeons at Ohio State University for design of uh, craniofacial bone replacements, the optimal shape for bone replacement for uh, patients who are missing certain parts of their face. And, uh, and another example is from material design. This is the case that uh, the, uh, the unknown is the shape of the microstructure of the material, and you're trying to find the, uh, you know, some extreme hit, some extreme properties, some target properties of the bulk. This is the example. This geometry was designed so that the bulk material would have the, the effect of negative Poisson's ratio. So if you pull on this material, rather than shrinking in the transversal direction, which is typically most material do, it actually gets fatter in the transversal direction. And this was actually fabricated at the University of Michigan so using some extrusion techniques uh, uh, by Professor John Halleron, I believe. So this just to give you an idea, and the list sort of continues. Um, but as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, you have a lot of things in common with uh, optimal control problems and, and, and uh, and inverse problems in general. So one of the fundamental sort of issues that one needs to address is the fact that you're dealing with an opposed problem. So even the simple compliance case where you had two competing effects and sort of an elliptic boundary value problem, uh, you have, you can't actually, you don't typically have existence of solutions. There is no optimal shape for the problem that we pose. So take the simple case of, of minimizing compliance, in other words, maximizing stiffness, of when the, in the case where the applied loads are uniform tr tractions. You're essentially pulling this plate apart. And uh, so it makes sense to put your material along the direction of the applied loads. This is the stiffest arrangement. 
you can actually show that the thinner you make these mem uh, layers and the more you distribute them, so the more oscillations you have from C minus to C plus phase, the better this becomes. And this minimizing sequence actually has no uh, uh, limit. It does not converge to any shape. Despite the fact that you can actually show that this attains the infimum of your problem and that infimum cannot be attained by any other shape. So this is an ill post problem, but the, the point of, of this is to show you that the tendency is to have these rapid oscillations in the boundary. So one has to, uh, to ensure existence of solutions, one has to you know, uh, impose some uniform regularity conditions on the admissible shapes. Another issue is that when you, if you discretize this problem, you have essentially two fields. If you recall, you have one field parametrizing the shape and then one field parametrizing the boundary value problem. So the choice of approximation spaces could sometimes lead to numerical instabilities. In this case, you can see these spurious checkerboard patterns. These are not optimal solutions, but they, they're a product of the discretization choices. And in the case of, for example, in this case with polygonal discretization, you can actually see that you get stable solutions. For those of you who are familiar with mixed variational problems, in, for example, Stokes flow, this is very typical of numerical instabilities. And lastly, um, at the end, you are left with a large scale optimization problem that's nonlinear, that's non convex, and that has very expensive function evaluations because you have to solve the associated boundary value problem. Like the, 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 the inverse problems that were mentioned earlier, you may also have to solve an adjoint problem as well. And the reason it's large scale is because to be able to represent the geometry with sufficient detail, a resolution, you have to have a lar you know, large number of design variables, large number of unknowns parameterizing the shape. And also to get an accurate response of the structure. So the, if the forward problem is more difficult, the state equation is a more complicated equation, you need to have a fine uh, spatial discretization to be able to get an accurate response. So one has to either, you know, for example, use adaptivity to, you know, to save on, on the, the, the cost associated with solving the forward problem, or you know, somehow play with the solver. And one of the, one of the key aspects is, uh, is actually finding a suitable optimization algorithm. That, uh, that works well for these problems. So typically people use some uh, separable convex approximations that work well for these problems. So uh, this is just a list of sort of you know, inherent difficulties associated with these problems. And what I'll do in the remainder of the talk uh, is to um, give you a flavor, an idea of how, for example, one goes about solving the, the minimum compliance problem. It's the simple bench, uh, model problem that I stated. So the first question is how do you parameterize shape? Um, we actually don't, uh, we don't fix a priori, uh, prescribe, for example, the connectivity of these unknown shapes. You don't prescribe the number of holes, for example, you ought to have in the final solution. So that's why sometimes you see the word topology optimization used because you don't fix topology a priori. But as I mentioned, you have this sort of discrete or this binary problem. You can pose the problem in terms of characteristic functions defined on your extended domain omega. So that's a binary problem. It doesn't lend itself to gradient-based algorithms. So an approach, one approach, one common approach is to relax the problem in a sense and uh, the, uh, parameterize your shape via these density functions that take rather than only values of 0, 1, values anywhere between 0 and 1. And then you go and augment your problem in such a way that in the optimal regime, you get solutions that are kind of, that are binary, densities that appear that are binary. Just to illustrate this point, so this is again, this, the extended domain is that box, and you have three admissible densities plotted in grayscale, one being plotted in black and zero being plotted in white for obvious reasons. And you can actually see this is an admissible density, these two are also admissible densities. This doesn't correspond to a shape, you can't really extract a shape from this. These two do, however, right? Because they have this sort of, they're nearly characteristic functions. But the idea is that you augment your problem. So for example, for the compliance problem, you either add a penalization term. This penalizes intermediate densities if rows between 0 or 1. This is a positive quantity, so you penalize this. This approach typically doesn't actually work very well because it adds to the non-convexity and non-linearity of your problem. Uh, but a more sort of an approach that takes into account or factors the fact that you have uh, the, the PDE constraint and you have that sort of behavior of uh, of uh, the influence of, of, of the PDE, the, the state equation, is to actually go and modify your state equation. So in the case of compliance, recall that you had two competing effects. One, you wanted to maximize stiffness while minimizing compliance, uh, minimizing volume. So if you go and actually penalize this intermediate stiffnesses, so rho to the power of p, for example, would be smaller than rho itself as p is greater than one. So you're assigning a smaller stiffness. 
to these intermediate values of, of rho. And uh, that, you know, for the case, for the problem of minimum compliance actually hopefully eliminates the rho. So at the end you get solutions that look like this. And hopefully the, then the optimal solution that you have would be the optimal shape corresponding to these densities. So, but this in and of itself doesn't address the elposiness. I, I mentioned the fact that you have this tendency to have large oscillations. If you actually solve what, the problem that I mentioned, so you discretize your rho and you discretize your u with finite elements and actually go and solve that problem, you will get solutions that are mesh dependent. So the finer you make your mesh, the, you get a different solution that has more members, thinner members, and thinner features, larger oscillations. So in order to ex ensure existence of solutions or you know, removal of this mesh dependency, dependency issue, you need to impose some uniform regularity condition. And now, since you're parameterizing the shapes via these density functions, you impose that on your density functions. Some, this is something that we, we sort of explored recently, uh, regularization based on sort of the classical Tikhonov type uh, regularization. This was already mentioned, I think, a number of times in the past two days, something of, of the similar nature. But this, for some reason, hasn't, hadn't been explored that much in, in uh, topology optimization. People had used the penalty term based on uh, uh, total variation of rho on physical grounds that corresponds to the perimeter of your design to put a cap on the perimeter of your design. But in this case, we're, we're requiring rho to be basically uniformly bounded, all the admissible densities to be uniformly bounded in H1. So you have, uh, you're minimizing the sort of the magnitude of the gradient. Um, and we kind of wanted to explore this, uh, the effect of this regularization. So we picked a very sort of simple optimization algorithm. I won't go into the details of this, but um, the idea is to basically, this is the gradient flow equation. You flow in the, neg the direction of the negative of the gradient. So, so the, in, the, in the case of, of this objective function, you have three terms. This would be the sensitivity of compliance, which is a strain energy density term. Now here you see u appearing, right? u being the solution to the boundary value problem. S compliance is self-adjoint, so you actually, the, the adjoint state is the same as the primal state. And then you have the Laplacian appearing uh, from the regularization term. So this is sort of a nonlinear parabolic evolution equation. You don't have any guarantee that this is going to converge to a steady state, which would be something that satisfies the first order condition of optimality. You don't have that guarantee. Uh, and you also need to con apply the constraints on rho. Rho has to be between 0 and 1. So we, you know, there are certain details that need to be taken care of. But the intuition is that if rho is, if, I'm sorry, if beta is 0, you basically increase density if strain energy density is higher than lambda and you decrease it when it's lower. So hopefully ultimately at the end you get something that has, this is zero so you have uniform state of strain energy density. That's the condition of optimality for compliance. Now very briefly I just want to mention that if you discretize this in this pseudo time variable in a semi-implicit way what you actually get and this is what we use rho n being the current density and rho n plus one being the next density is that you get, this is the gradient descent, this is the original gradient descent update expression uh, without the influence of beta, and you get the sort of the modified Helmholtz operator on the left-hand side, so that gives you the smoothing effect. And this is sort of in contrast to what you see in the literature. So here's some results. This is a problem, you have a simply supported beam with a load at the mid span, so it's supported at two corners. I'm showing half of the domain because the problem is symmetric. And this is, this is the optimal solutions for various uh, values of beta. The larger the beta, the less complex the solution is. And you can see that you get these solutions in moderate number of iterations, something on the order of 100 to 200 iterations. One thing I want to call your attention to is that for, even for large beta, you don't actually increase the amount of gray or the intermediate densities that you get. And this is, this is important uh, for the reasons that I mentioned before. But also this, this, this regularization, you can see that it's, it's significant from an engineering perspective because sometimes you want to specify a sort of small feature size for fabrication uh, uh, purposes. Uh, and just to compare uh, this, this, this approach, this Tikhonov based regularization with the common approach which is based on filtering in the literature, uh, you see that in the, uh, with this filtering approach, I won't go into the details of it, you get smeared geometries and, you have, and that essentially means that you have a lot of intermediate densities. And the reason for that is because these formulations sort of build uh, the smoothness into these density, admissible density functions. So variation from black to white has to occur over some distance. So you get these smeared behavior and that's actually not very good. If your physics, this sometimes interrupts or uh, interferes with your physics of the problem. So 
Before I conclude, and I think I'm just about out of time, uh, I would like to mention, the, just plug something that we just did recently. We published a series of educational papers uh, that are going to appear soon in the structural and multidisciplinary optimization. Two papers, both have MATLAB codes associated with them for solving two-dimensional problems. You actually have the, uh, the, the code, the support for prescribing the geometry of your extended domain. This is another toy problem. This is a hook. They sort of apply loads here and it's supported over there and this is the optimal geometry. So you have the mesh generator so, and also uh, the finite element associated with this uh, Voronoi meshes to solve these Voronoi meshes. And there's also a framework for optimization, sensitivity analysis and so on. Uh, all, but what I want to call your attention to is the fact that the second paper also has a relatively comprehensive introduction to the problem of shape and topology optimization. So if you're interested in reading that, I would refer you to these papers. With that said, I'd like to acknowledge, of course, my advisor and our uh, colleagues at, uh, in, in Rio, uh, Pukki University in Rio. Of course, uh, the Krell staff over the past four years have been extremely supportive, so I can't uh, express my gratitude enough. And uh, I'm very grateful for this uh, DOE CSGF fellowship. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Just to give you an idea, this is a, this is a result from a paper from 1904 on optimal frames. So these are frame structures. Uh, and this is this, the so-called Michel problem, because he's the one that solved it. I did a rendering, I don't know why, wanted to be artsy, of, of a numerical result from actually our code. You can actually kind of see the, the similar orthogonal network that uh, formed these optimal shapes this, for this problem. Thank you very much. <laughs>